This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 7 The Bean Field. Meanwhile, my beans, the length of whose rows added together was seven miles already planted, were impatient to be hoed, for the earliest had grown considerably before the latest were in the ground. Indeed, they were not easily to be put off. What was the meaning of this so steady and self-respecting, this small Herculean labor, I knew not. I came to love my rows, my beans, though so many more than I wanted. They attached me to the earth, and so I got strength, like Antaeus. But why should I raise them? Only heaven knows. This was my curious labor all summer, to make this portion of the earth's surface, which had yielded only sank foil, blackberries, John's wart, and the like before, Sweet wild fruits and pleasant flowers produce instead this pulse. What shall I learn of beans, or beans of me? I cherish them, I hoe them, early and late I have an eye to them, and this is my day's work. It is a fine broad leaf to look on. My auxiliaries are the dews and rains which water this dry soil and what fertility is in the soil itself, which for the most part is lean and effete. My enemies are worms, cool days, and most of all woodchucks. The last have nibbled for me a quarter of an acre clean. But what right had I to oust John's wart and the rest and break up their ancient herb garden? Soon, however, the remaining beans will be too tough for them, and go forward to meet new foes. When I was four years old, as I well remember, I was brought from Boston to this my native town, through these very woods and this field, to the pond. It is one of the oldest scenes stamped on my memory, and now to-night my flute has waked the echoes over that very water. The pines still stand here older than I, or if some have fallen, I have cooked my supper with their stumps. And a new growth is rising all around, preparing another aspect for new infant eyes. Almost the same John Zwart springs from the same perennial root in this pasture. And even I have at length helped to clothe that fabulous landscape of my infant dreams and one of the results of my presence and influence is seen in these bean-leaves, corn-blades, and potato-vines. I planted about two acres and a half of upland, and as it was only about fifteen years since the land was cleared, and I myself had got out two or three cords of stumps, I did not give it any manure. But in the course of the summer it appeared by the arrowheads which I turned up in the hoeing, that an extinct nation had anciently dwelled here and planted corn and beans ere white men came to clear the land, and so to some extent had exhausted the soil for this very crop. Before yet any woodchuck or squirrel had run across the road or the sun had got above the shrub oaks, while all the dew was on, though the farmers warned me against it, I would advise you to do all your work if possible while the dew is on. I began to level the ranks of haughty weeds in my bean-field and throw dust upon their heads. Early in the morning I worked barefooted, dabbling like a plastic artist in the dewy and crumbling sand. But later in the day the sun blistered my feet. There the sun lighted me to hoe beans, pacing slowly backward and forward over that yellow, gravelly upland between the long green rows, fifteen rods, the one end terminating in a shrub-oak copse, where I could rest in the shade, 
the other in a blackberry field where the green berries deepened their tints by the time I had made another bout, removing the weeds, putting fresh soil about the bean stems, and encouraging this weed which I had sown, making the yellow soil express its summer thought in bean leaves and blossoms rather than in wormwood and piper and millet grass, making the earth say beans instead of grass. This was my daily work. As I had little aid from horses or cattle or hired men or boys or improved implements of husbandry, I was much slower and became much more intimate with my beans than usual. But labor of the hands, even when pursued to the verge of drudgery, is perhaps never the worst form of idleness. It has a constant and imperishable moral, and to the scholar it yields a classic result, a very agricola laboriosus, was I to travellers bound westward through Lincoln and Wayland to nobody knows where, they sitting at their ease in gigs with elbows on knees and reins loosely hanging in festoons, I the homestaying, laborious native of the soil. But soon my homestead was out of their sight and thought. It was the only open and cultivated field for a great distance on either side of the road. So they made the most of it and sometimes the man in the field heard more of traveller's gossip and comment than was meant for his ear. "'Beans so late? Peas so late?' For I continued to plant when others had begun to hoe. The ministerial husbandman had not suspected it. "'Corn, my boy, for fodder, corn for fodder! Does he live there?' asks the black bonnet of the grey coat, and the hard-featured farmer reins up his grateful dobbin to inquire what you are doing where he sees no manure in the furrow, and recommends a little chip dirt, or any little waste stuff, or it may be ashes or plaster. But here were two acres and a half of furrows, and only a hoe for cart and two hands to draw it, there being an aversion to other carts and horses, and chip dirt far away. Fellow travellers, as they rattled by, compared it aloud with the fields which they had passed, so that I came to know how I stood in the agricultural world. This was one field not in Mr. Coleman's report. And by the way, who estimates the value of the crop which nature yields in the still wilder fields unimproved by man? The crop of English hay is carefully weighed, the moisture calculated, the silicates and the potash, but in all dells and pond-holes in the woods and pastures and swamps grows a rich and various crop only unreaped by man. Mine was, as it were, the connecting link between wild and cultivated fields. As some states are civilized and others half-civilized and others savage or barbarous, so my field was, though not in a bad sense, a half-cultivated field. They were beans, cheerfully returning to their wild and primitive state that I cultivated, and my hoe played the rangs de vache for them. Near at hand, upon the topmost spray of a birch, sings the brown thrasher, or Red Mavis, as some love to call him, all the morning glad of your society that would find out another farmer's field if yours were not here. While you are planting the seed, he cries, Drop it! Drop it! Cover it up! Cover it up! Pull it up! Pull it up! Pull it up! But this was not corn, and so it was safe from such enemies as he. You may wonder what his rigmarole, his amateur Paganini performances on one string or on twenty, have to do with your planting, and yet prefer it to leached ashes or plaster. It was a cheap sort of top-dressing in which I had entire faith. As I drew a still fresher soil about the rose with my hoe, 
I disturb the ashes of unchronicled nations, who in primeval years lived under these heavens, and their small implements of war and hunting were brought to the light of this modern day. They lay mingled with other natural stones, some of which bore the marks of having been burned by Indian fires, and some by the sun, and also bits of pottery and glass brought hither by the recent cultivators of the soil. When my hoe tinkled against the stones, that music echoed to the woods in the sky, and was an accompaniment to my labor, which yielded an instant and immeasurable crop. It was no longer beans that I hoed, nor I that hoed beans, and I remembered with as much pity as pride, if I remembered at all, my acquaintances who had gone to the city to attend the oratorios. The night hawk circled overhead in the sunny afternoons, for I sometimes made a day of it, like a moat in the eye, or in heaven's eye, falling from time to time with a swoop and a sound as if the heavens were rent, torn at last to very rags and tatters, and yet a seamless cope remained. Small imps that fill the air and lay their eggs on the ground on bare sand or rocks on the tops of hills, where few have found them, graceful and slender like ripples caught up from the pond, as leaves are raised by the wind to float in the heavens. Such kindredship is in nature. The hawk is aerial brother of the wave which he sails over and surveys. Those his perfect air-inflated wings answering to the elemental unfledged pinions of the sea. Or sometimes I watched a pair of hen-hawks circling high in the sky, alternately soaring and descending, approaching and leaving one another, as if they were the embodiment of my own thoughts. Or I was attracted by the passage of wild pigeons from this wood to that, with a slight quivering winnowing sound and carrier haste, or from under a rotten stump my hoe turned up a sluggish portentous and outlandish spotted salamander, a trace of Egypt in the Nile, yet our contemporary. When I paused to lean on my hoe, these sounds and sights I heard and saw anywhere in the row, a part of the inexhaustible entertainment which the country offers. On gala days the town fires its great guns, which echo like pop-guns to these woods, and some waifs of martial music occasionally penetrate thus far. To me, away there in my bean-field at the other end of the town, the big guns sounded as if a puff-ball had burst, and when there was a military turnout of which I was ignorant, I have sometimes had a vague sense all the day of some sort of itching and disease in the horizon, as if some eruption would break out there soon, either scarlatina or canker rash, until at length some more favorable puff of wind, making haste over the fields and up the wayland road, brought me information of these trainers. It seemed by the distant hum as if somebody's bees had swarmed, and that the neighbors, according to Virgil's advice, by a faint tintinabulum upon the most sonorous of their domestic utensils, were endeavoring to call them down into the hive again. And when the sound died quite away, and the hum had ceased, and the most favorable breezes told no tale, I knew that they had got the last drone of them all safely into the middle-sex hive, and that now their minds were bent on the honey with which it was smeared. I felt proud to know that the liberties of Massachusetts and of our fatherland were in such safe keeping, and as I turned to my hoeing again I was filled with an inexpressible confidence, and pursued my labor cheerfully with a calm trust in the future. 
When there were several bands of musicians, it sounded as if all the village was a vast bellows, and all the buildings expanded and collapsed alternately with a din. But sometimes it was a really noble and inspiring strain that reached these woods, and the trumpet that sings of fame, and I felt as if I could spit a Mexican with a good relish. For why should we always stand for trifles? and looked round for a woodchuck or a skunk to exercise my chivalry upon. These martial strains seemed as far away as Palestine, and reminded me of a march of crusaders in the horizon, with a slight tantivy and tremulous motion of the elm-tree tops which overhang the village. This was one of the great days though the sky had from my clearing only the same everlastingly great look that it wears daily, and I saw no difference in it. It was a singular experience, that long acquaintance which I cultivated with beans, what with planting and hoeing and harvesting and threshing and picking over and selling them. The last was the hardest of all. I might add eating, for I did taste. I was determined to know beans. When they were growing, I used to hoe from five o'clock in the morning till noon, and commonly spent the rest of the day about other affairs. Consider the intimate and curious acquaintance one makes with various kinds of weeds. It will bear some iteration in the account, for there was no little iteration in the labor, disturbing their delicate organization so ruthlessly and making such invidious distinctions with his hoe, leveling whole ranks of one species, and sedulously cultivating another. That's Roman wormwood, that's pigweed, that's sorrel, that's piper-grass. Have at him! Chop him up, turn his roots upward to the sun, don't let him have a fibre in the shade. If you do, he'll turn himself to other side up, and be as green as a leek in two days." A long war, not with cranes, but with weeds, those Trojans who had sun and rain and dews on their side. Daily the beans saw me come to their rescue, armed with a hoe, and thinned the ranks of their enemies, filled up the trenches with weedy dead. Many a lusty crest, waving Hector, that towered a whole foot above his crowding comrades, fell before my weapon, and rolled in the dust. Those summer days, which some of my contemporaries devoted to the fine arts in Boston or Rome, and others to contemplation in India, and others to trade in London or New York, I thus, with the other farmers of New England, devoted to husbandry. Not that I wanted beans to eat, for I am by nature a Pythagorean, so far as beans are concerned, whether they mean porridge or voting, and exchange them for rice. But perchance, as some must work in fields, if only for the sake of tropes and expression, to serve a parable-maker one day. It was on the whole a rare amusement, which, continued too long, might have become a dissipation. Though I gave them no manure, and did not hoe them all at once, I hoed them unusually well as far as I went, and was paid for it in the end. There being in truth, as Evelyn says, no compost or latation whatsoever comparable to this continual motion, repastination, and turning of the mould with the spade. The earth, he adds elsewhere, especially if fresh, has a certain magnetism in it, by which it attracts the salt, power, or virtue, call it either, which gives it life, and is the logic of all the labor and stir we keep about it, to sustain us. All the dungings and other sordid temperings being but the vicar's succedaneous to this improvement. Moreover, this being one of those worn-out and exhausted lay-fields which enjoy their Sabbath, had perchance as Sir Kenelm Digby thinks likely, attracted vital spirits from the air. I harvested twelve bushels of beans. 
but to be more particular for it is complained that mr coleman has reported chiefly the expensive experiments of gentlemen farmers my outgoes were for a hoe fifty-four cents ploughing harrowing and furrowing seven dollars and fifty cents too much beans for seed three dollars and twelve cents plus potatoes for seed one dollar and thirty-three cents peas for seed forty cents turnip seed six cents white line for crow fence two cents horse cultivator and boy three hours one dollar horse and cart to get crop seventy-five cents in all fourteen dollars seventy-two cents plus my income was patrem familius vendesum non emassum es apportet from nine bushels and twelve quarts of beans sold sixteen dollars ninety four cents five bushels large potatoes two dollars fifty cents nine bushels small potatoes two dollars and twenty five cents grass one dollar stocks seventy five cents in all twenty three dollars forty four cents leaving a pecuniary profit as i have elsewhere said of eight dollars seventy one cents plus this is the result of my experience in raising beans plant the common small white bush bean about the first of june in rows three feet by eighteen inches apart being careful to select fresh round and unmixed seed first look out for worms and supply vacancies by planting anew then look out for woodchucks if it is an exposed place for they will nibble off the nearest tender leaves almost clean as they go and again when the young tendrils make their appearance they have notice of it and will shear them off with both buds and young pods sitting erect like a squirrel but above all harvest as early as possible if you would escape frosts and have a fair and saleable crop you may save much loss by this means this further experience also i gained i said to myself i will not plant beans and corn with so much industry another summer but such seeds if the seed is not lost as sincerity truth simplicity faith innocence and the like and see if they will not grow in this soil even with less toil and manurance and sustain me for surely it has not been exhausted for these crops alas i said this to myself but now another summer is gone and another and another and i am obliged to say to you reader that the seeds which i planted if indeed they were the seeds of those virtues were worm-eaten or had lost their vitality and so did not come up commonly men will only be brave as their fathers were brave or timid this generation is very sure to plant corn and beans each new year precisely as the indians did centuries ago and taught the first settlers to do as if there were a fate in it i saw an old man the other day to my astonishment making the holes with a hoe for the seventieth time at least and not for himself to lie down in but why should not the new englander try new adventures and not lay so much stress on his grain his potato and grass crop and his orchards raise other crops than these why concern ourselves so much about our beans for seed and not be concerned at all about a new generation of men we should really be fed and cheered if when we met a man we were sure to see that some of the qualities which i have named which we all prize more than those other productions but which are for the most part broadcast and floating in the air had taken root and grown in him here comes such a subtle and ineffable quality for instance as truth or justice though the slightest amount or new variety of it along the road our ambassadors should be instructed to send home such seeds as these 
and Congress help to distribute them over all the land. We should never stand upon ceremony with sincerity. We should never cheat and insult and banish one another by our meanness. If there were present the kernel of worth and friendliness, we should not meet thus in haste. Most men I do not meet at all, for they seem not to have time. They are busy about their beans. We would not deal with a man thus plodding ever, leaning on a hoe or a spade as a staff between his work, not as a mushroom, but partially risen out of the earth, something more than erect, like swallows alighted and walking on the ground. And as he spake, his wings would now and then spread, as he meant to fly, then close again. So that we should suspect that we might be conversing with an angel. Bread may not always nourish us, but it always does us good. It even takes stiffness out of our joints, and makes us supple and buoyant, when we knew not what ailed us, to recognize any generosity in man or nature, to share any unmixed and heroic joy. Ancient poetry and mythology suggest at least that husbandry was once a sacred art, but it is pursued with irreverent haste and heedlessness by us, our object being to have large farms and large crops merely. We have no festival, no procession, no ceremony, not excepting our cattle shows and so-called thanksgivings, by which the farmer expresses a sense of the sacredness of his calling, or is reminded of its sacred origin. It is the premium and the feast which tempt him. He sacrifices not to Ceres and the terrestrial Jove, but to the infernal Plutus, rather. By avarice and selfishness, and a groveling habit, from which none of us is free, of regarding the soil as property, or the means of acquiring property, chiefly. The landscape is deformed, husbandry is degraded with us, and the farmer leads the meanest of lives. He knows nature but as a robber. Cato says that the prophets of agriculture are particularly pious or just. Maximic pius questus. And according to Vero, the old Romans, called the same earth mother and Ceres, and thought that they who cultivate it led a pious and useful life, and that they alone were left of the race of King Saturn. We are wont to forget that the sun looks on our cultivated fields and on the prairies and forests without distinction. They all reflect and absorb his rays alike, and the former make but a small part of the glorious picture which he beholds in his daily course. In his view the earth is all equally cultivated like a garden. Therefore we should receive the benefit of his light and heat with a corresponding trust and magnanimity. What though I value the seed of these beans, and harvest that in the fall of the year? This broad field which I have looked at so long looks not to me as the principal cultivator, but away from me to influences more genial to it, which water and make it green. These beans have results which are not harvested by me. Do they not grow for woodchucks, partly? The ear of wheat, in Latin spica, obsoletely specca, from spe, hope, should not be the only hope of the husbandman. Its kernel or grain, granum, from gerendo, bearing, is not all that it bears. How then can our harvest fail? Shall I not rejoice also at the abundance of the weeds, whose seeds are the granary of the birds? It matters little comparatively whether the fields fill the farmer's barns. The true husbandman will cease from anxiety, 
as the squirrels manifest no concern whether the woods will bear chestnuts this year or not, and finish his labor with every day, relinquishing all claim to the produce of his fields, and sacrificing in his mind not only his first, but his last fruits also. End of chapter 7This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden. Chapter 8. The Village. After hoeing, or perhaps reading and writing, in the forenoon, I usually bathed again in the pond swimming across one of its coves for a stint, and washed the dust of labor from my person, or smoothed out the last wrinkle which study had made, and for the afternoon was absolutely free. Every day or two I strolled to the village, to hear some of the gossip which is incessantly going on there, circulating either from mouth to mouth or from newspaper to newspaper, and which, taken in homeopathic doses, was really as refreshing in its way as the rustle of leaves and the peeping of frogs. As I walked in the woods to see the birds and squirrels, so I walked in the village to see the men and boys. Instead of the wind among the pines I heard the carts rattle. In one direction from my house there was a colony of muskrats in the river meadows, under the grove of elms and buttonwoods. In the other horizon was a village of busy men as curious to me as if they had been prairie dogs, each sitting at the mouth of its burrow, or running over to a neighbor's to gossip. I went there frequently to observe their habits. The village appeared to me a great newsroom, and on one side, to support it, as once at Reading and Company's on State Street, they kept nuts and raisins, or salt and meal and other groceries. Some have such a vast appetite for the former commodity, that is, the news, and such sound digestive organs, that they can sit forever in public avenues without stirring, and let it simmer and whisper through them, like the Etesian winds, or as if inhaling ether, it only producing numbness and insensibility to pain, otherwise it would often be painful to bear, without affecting the consciousness. I hardly ever failed, when I rambled through the village, to see a row of such worthies, either sitting on a ladder, sunning themselves with their bodies inclined forward and their eyes glancing along the line this way and that from time to time with a voluptuous expression, or else leaning against a barn with their hands in their pockets, like caryatides, as if to prop it up, they, being commonly out of doors, heard whatever was in the wind. These are the coarsest mills, in which all gossip is first rudely digested or cracked up before it is emptied into finer and more delicate hoppers within doors. I observed that the vitals of the village were the grocery, the bar-room, the post-office, and the bank, and, as a necessary part of the machinery, they kept a bell, a big gun, and a fire-engine at convenient places, and the houses were so arranged as to make the most of mankind, in lanes and fronting one another so that every traveller had to run the gauntlet, and every man, woman, and child might get a lick at him. Of course those who were stationed nearest to the head of the line, where they could most see and be seen, and have the first blow at him, paid the highest prices for their places and the few straggling inhabitants in the outskirts, where long gaps in the line began to occur, and the traveller could get over walls or turn aside into cow-paths and so escape, paid a very slight ground or window tax. Signs were hung out on all sides to allure him, some to catch him by the appetite as the tavern and victualling cellar, some by the fancy as the dry goods store and the jeweller's 
and others by the hair or the feet or the skirts, as the barber, the shoemaker, or the tailor. Besides, there was a still more terrible standing invitation to call at every one of these houses, and company expected about these times. For the most part I escaped wonderfully from these dangers, either by proceeding at once boldly and without deliberation to the goal, as is recommended to those who run the gauntlet, or by keeping my thoughts on high things, like Orpheus, who, loudly singing the praises of the gods to his lyre, drowned the voices of the sirens, and kept out of danger. Sometimes I bolted suddenly, and nobody could tell my whereabouts, for I did not stand much about gracefulness, and never hesitated at a gap in a fence. I was even accustomed to make an eruption into some houses, where I was well entertained, and after learning the colonel's and very last sieve full of news, what had subsided, the prospects of war and peace, and whether the world was likely to hold together much longer, I was let out through the rear avenues, and so escaped to the woods again. It was very pleasant when I stayed late in town to launch myself into the night, especially if it was dark and tempestuous, and set sail for some bright village parlour or lecture-room, with a bag of rye or Indian meal upon my shoulder, for my snug harbour in the woods, having made all tight, without and withdrawn under hatches with a merry crew of thoughts, leaving only my outer man at the helm, or even tying up the helm when it was plain sailing. I had many a genial thought by the cabin fire, as I sailed. I was never cast away, nor distressed in any weather, though I encountered some severe storms. It is darker in the woods, even in common nights, than most suppose. I frequently had to look up at the opening between the trees above the path in order to learn my route, and, where there was no cart-path, to feel with my feet the faint track which I had worn, or steer by the known relation of particular trees, which I felt with my hands, passing between two pines, for instance, not more than eighteen inches apart, in the midst of the woods, invariably in the darkest night. Sometimes after coming home thus late in a dark and muggy night, when my feet felt the path which my eyes could not see, dreaming and absent-minded all the way, until I was aroused by having to raise my hand to lift the latch, I have not been able to recall a single step of my walk, and I have thought that perhaps my body would find its way home if its master should forsake it, as the hand finds its way to the mouth without assistance. Several times, when a visitor chanced to stay into evening, and it proved a dark night, I was obliged to conduct him to the cart-path in the rear of the house, and then point out to him the direction he was to pursue, and in keeping which he was to be guided rather by his feet than his eyes. One very dark night I directed thus on their way two young men who had been fishing in the pond. They lived about a mile off through the woods, and were quite used to the route. A day or two after one of them told me that they wandered about the greater part of the night, close by their own premises, and did not get home till toward morning, by which time, as there had been several heavy showers in the meanwhile, and the leaves were very wet, they were drenched to their skins. I have heard of many going astray even in the village streets, when the darkness was so thick that you could cut it with a knife, as the saying is. Some who live in the outskirts, having come to town a-shopping in their wagons, have been obliged to put up for the night, and gentlemen and ladies making a call have gone half a mile out of their way, feeling the sidewalk only with their feet, and not knowing when they turned. It is a surprising and memorable as well as valuable experience to be lost in the woods any time. Often in a snowstorm, even by day, one will come out upon a well-known road and yet find it impossible to tell which way leads to the village. Though he knows that he has travelled it a thousand times, he cannot recognize a feature in it, but it is as strange to him as if it were a road in Siberia. 
By night, of course, the perplexity is infinitely greater. In our most trivial walks we are constantly, though unconsciously, steering like pilots by certain well-known beacons and headlands. And if we go beyond our usual course we still carry in our minds the bearing of some neighboring cape, and not till we are completely lost or turned around, for a man needs only to be turned round once with his eyes shut in this world to be lost, do we appreciate the vastness and strangeness of nature. Every man has to learn the points of compass again as often as be awakes, whether from sleep or any abstraction, not till we are lost. In other words, not till we have lost the world do we begin to find ourselves and realize where we are and the infinite extent of our relations. One afternoon, near the end of the first summer, when I went to the village to get a shoe from the cobblers, I was seized and put into jail, because, as I have elsewhere related, I did not pay a tax to, or recognize the authority of, the state which buys and sells men, women, and children like cattle at the door of its senate house. I had gone down to the woods for other purposes. But wherever a man goes, men will pursue and paw him with their dirty institutions, and if they can, constrain him to belong to their desperate odd-fellow society. It is true, I might have resisted forcibly with more or less effect, might have run amok against society but I preferred that society should run amok against me, it being the desperate party. However, I was released the next day, obtained my mended shoe, and returned to the woods, in season to get my dinner of huckleberries on Fairhaven Hill. I was never molested by any person but those who represented the state. I had no lock nor bolt but for the desk which held my papers not even a nail to put over my latch or windows. I never fastened my door night or day, though I was to be absent several days, not even when the next fall I spent a fortnight in the woods of Maine. And yet my house was more respected than if it had been surrounded by a file of soldiers. The tired rambler could rest and warm himself by my fire. The literary amuse himself with the few books on my table, or the curious, by opening my closet door, see what was left of my dinner, and what prospect I had of supper. Yet though many people of every class came this way to the pond, I suffered no serious inconvenience from these sources, and I never missed anything but one small book, a volume of Homer, which perhaps was improperly gilded, and this I trust a soldier of our camp has found by this time. I am convinced that if all men were to live as simply as I then did, thieving and robbery would be unknown. These take place only in communities where some have got more than is sufficient, while others have not enough. The Pope's homers would soon get properly distributed. Nec bella ferunt faginus astabat dom scyphus ante dapus. Nor wars did men molest, when only beechen bowls were in request. You who govern public affairs, what need have you to employ punishments? Love virtue, and the people will be virtuous. The virtues of a superior man are like the wind. The virtues of a common man are like the grass. I, the grass, when the wind passes over it, bends. End of chapter 8「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 9 The Pawns. Sometimes, having a surfeit of human society and gossip, and worn out all my village friends, I rambled still farther westward than I habitually dwell, into yet more unfrequented parts of the town, to fresh woods and pastures new, or while the sun was setting made my supper of huckleberries and blueberries on Fair Haven Hill, and laid up a store for several days. The fruits do not yield their true flavor to the purchaser of them, nor to him who raises them for the market. There is but one way to obtain it, yet few take that way. If you would know the flavor of huckleberries, ask the cowboy or the partridge. It is a vulgar error to suppose that you have tasted huckleberries who never plucked them. A huckleberry never reaches Boston. They have not been known there since they grew on her three hills. The ambrosial and essential part of the fruit is lost, with the bloom which is rubbed off in the market cart, or they become mere provender. As long as eternal justice reigns, not one innocent huckleberry can be transported thither from the country's hills. Occasionally, after my hoeing was done for the day, I joined some impatient companion who had been fishing on the pond since morning, as silent and motionless as a duck or a floating leaf, and after practicing various kinds of philosophy, had concluded commonly by the time I arrived that he belonged to the ancient sect of Cenobites. There was one older man, an excellent fisher and skilled in all kinds of woodcraft, who was pleased to look upon my house as a building erected for the convenience of fishermen, and I was equally pleased when he sat in my doorway to arrange his lines. He at one end of the boat and I at the other, but not many words passed between us for he had grown deaf in his later years, but he occasionally hummed a psalm, which harmonized well enough with my philosophy. Our intercourse was thus altogether one of unbroken harmony, far more pleasing to remember than if it had been carried on by speech. When, as was commonly the case, I had none to commune with, I used to raise the echoes by striking with a paddle on the side of my boat, filling the surrounding woods with circling and dilating sounds, stirring them up as the keeper of a menagerie his wild beasts, until I elicited a growl from every wooded vale and hillside. In warm evenings I frequently sat in the boat playing the flute, and saw the perch, which I seemed to have charmed, hovering around me, and the moon travelling over the ribbed bottom, which was strewed with the wrecks of the forest. Formerly I had come to this pond adventurously from time to time, in dark summer nights, with a companion, and making a fire close to the water's edge, which we thought attracted the fishes, we caught pouts with a bunch of worms strung on a thread, and when we had done far in the night, threw the burning brands high into the air like sky-rockets, which, coming down into the pond, were quenched with a loud hissing, and we were suddenly groping in total darkness. Through this, whistling a tune, we took our way to the haunts of men again, but now I had made my home by the shore. Sometimes, after staying in a village parlour till the family had all retired, I have returned to the woods, and partly with a view to the next day's dinner, spent the hours of midnight fishing from a boat by moonlight, serenaded by owls and foxes, and hearing from time to time the creaking note of some unknown bird close at hand. 
these experiences were very memorable and valuable to me. Anchored in forty feet of water, and twenty or thirty rods from the shore, surrounded sometimes by thousands of small perch and shiners, dimpling the surface with their tails in the moonlight, and communicating by a long flaxen line with mysterious nocturnal fishes which had their dwelling forty feet below, or sometimes dragging sixty feet of line about the pond as I drifted in the gentle night breeze, now and then feeling a slight vibration along it, indicative of some life prowling about its extremity, of dull, uncertain, blundering purpose there, and slow to make up its mind. At length you slowly raise, pulling hand over hand, some horned pout, squeaking and squirming to the upper air. It was very queer, especially in dark nights, when your thoughts had wandered to vast and cosmogonal themes in other spheres, to feel this faint jerk which came to interrupt your dreams and link you to nature again. It seemed as if I might next cast my line upward into the air, as well as downward into this element, which was scarcely more dense. Thus I caught two fishes, as it were, with one hook. The scenery of Walden is on a humble scale, and, though very beautiful, does not approach to grandeur, nor can it much concern one who has not long frequented it, or lived by its shore. Yet this pond is so remarkable for its depth and purity as to merit a particular description. It is a clear and deep green well, half a mile long and a mile and three quarters in circumference, and contains about sixty-one and a half acres a perennial spring in the midst of pine and oak woods, without any visible inlet or outlet except by the clouds and evaporation. The surrounding hills rise abruptly from the water to the height of forty to eighty feet, though on the southeast and east they attain to about one hundred and one hundred and fifty feet respectively, within a quarter and a third of a mile. They are exclusively woodland. All our Concord waters have two colors at least, one when viewed at a distance, and another more proper close at hand. The first depends more on the light, and follows the sky. In clear weather in summer they appear blue at a little distance, especially if agitated, and at a great distance all appear alike. In stormy weather they are sometimes a, a dark slate color. The sea, however, is said to be blue one day and green another without any perceptible change in the atmosphere. I have seen our river when, the landscape being covered with snow, both water and ice were almost as green as grass. Some consider blue to be the color of pure water, whether liquid or solid. But looking directly down into our waters from a boat, they are seen to be of very different colors. Walden is blue at one time and green at another, even from the same point of view. Lying between the earth and the heavens, it partakes of the color of both. Viewed from a hilltop it reflects the color of the sky, but near at hand it is of a yellowish tint, next the shore where you can see the sand, then a light green, which gradually deepens to a uniform dark green in the body of the pond. In some lights, viewed even from a hilltop, it is of a vivid green next to the shore. Some have referred this to the reflection of the verdure, but it is equally green there against the railroad sandbank, 
and in the spring before the leaves are expanded, and it may be simply the result of the prevailing blue mixed with the yellow of the sand, such is the color of its iris. This is that portion also, where in the spring the ice being warmed by the heat of the sun, reflected from the bottom, and also transmitted through the earth, melts first and forms a narrow canal about the still frozen middle. Like the rest of our waters, when much agitated, in clear weather, so that the surface of the waves may reflect the sky at the right angle, or because there is more light mixed with it, it appears at a little distance of a darker blue than the sky itself. And at such a time, being on its surface, and looking with divided vision, so as to see the reflection, I have discerned a matchless and indescribable light blue, such as watered or changeable silks and sword-blades suggest, more cerulean than the sky itself, alternating with the original dark green on the opposite sides of the waves, which last appeared but muddy in comparison. It is a vitreous greenish blue, as I remember it, like those patches of the winter sky seen through cloud vistas in the west before sundown. Yet a single glass of its water held up to the light is as colorless as an equal quantity of air. It is well known that a large plate of glass will have a green tint, owing, as the makers say, to its body, but a small piece of the same will be colorless. How large a body of Walden water would be required to reflect a green tint, I have never proved. The water of our river is black, or a very dark brown to one looking directly down on it, and like that of most ponds imparts to the body of one bathing in it a yellowish tinge. But this water is of such crystalline purity that the body of the bather appears of an alabaster whiteness, still more unnatural, which, as the limbs are magnified and distorted withal, produces a monstrous effect, making fit studies for a Michelangelo. The water is so transparent that the bottom can easily be discerned at the depth of twenty-five or thirty feet. Paddling over it, you may see, many feet beneath the surface, the schools of perch and shiners, perhaps only an inch long, yet the former easily distinguished by their transverse bars, and you think that they must be ascetic fish that find a subsistence there. Once in the winter, many years ago, when I had been cutting holes through the ice in order to catch pickerel, as I stepped ashore I tossed my axe back on to the ice, but, as if some evil genius had directed it, it slid four or five rods directly into one of the holes, where the water was twenty-five feet deep. Out of curiosity I laid down on the ice, and looked through the hole, until I saw the axe a little on one side standing on its head with its helve erect and gently swaying to and fro with the pulse of the pond. And there it might have stood erect and swaying till in the course of time the handle rotted off, if I had not disturbed it. Making another hole directly over it, with an ice chisel which I had, and cutting down the longest birch which I could find in the neighborhood with my knife, I made a slip noose which I attached to its end, and letting it down carefully, passed it over the knob of the handle, and drew it by a line along the birch, and so pulled the axe out again. The shore is composed of a belt of smooth, rounded white stones, like paving stones, except one or two short sand beaches, and is so steep that in many places a single leap will carry you into water over your head. And were it not for its remarkable transparency, that would be the last to be seen of its bottom till it rose on the opposite side. Some think it is bottomless. It is nowhere muddy, 
and a casual observer would say that there were no weeds at all in it, and of noticeable plants, except in the little meadows recently overflowed, which do not properly belong to it, a closer scrutiny does not detect a flag, nor a bulrush, nor even a lily, yellow or white, but only a few small heart-leaves and potamogetons, and perhaps a water-target or two, all which, however, a bather might not perceive, and these plants are clean and bright like the element they grow in. The stones extend a rod or two into the water, and then the bottom is pure sand, except in the deepest part, where there is usually a little sediment, probably from the decay of the leaves which have been wafted on to it, so many successive falls, and a bright green weed is brought up on anchors even in midwinter. We have one other pond just like this, White Pond, in Nine Acre Corner, about two and a half miles westerly. But, though I am acquainted with most of the ponds within a dozen miles of this center, I do not know a third of this pure and well-like character. Successive nations perchance have drank at, admired, and fathomed it, and passed away, and still its water is green and pellucid as ever. Not an intermitting spring. Perhaps on that spring morning when Adam and Eve were driven out of Eden, Walden Pond was already in existence, and even then breaking up in a gentle spring rain accompanied with mist and a southerly wind, and covered with myriads of ducks and geese which had not heard of the fall, when still such pure lakes sufficed them. Even then it had commenced to rise and fall, and had clarified its waters, and colored them of the hue they now wear, and obtained a patent of heaven to be the only Walden pond in the world, and distiller of celestial dews. Who knows in how many unremembered nations' literatures this has been the Castalian fountain? or what nymphs presided over it in the golden age. It is a gem of the first water which Concord wears in her coronet. Yet, perchance, the first who came to this well have left some trace of their footsteps. I have been surprised to detect, encircling the pond, even where a thick wood has just been cut down on the shore a narrow shelf-like path in the steep hillside, alternately rising and falling, approaching and receding from the water's edge, as old probably as the race of man here, worn by the feet of aboriginal hunters, and still from time to time unwittingly trodden by the present occupants of the land. This is particularly distinct to one standing on the middle of the pond in winter, just after a light snow has fallen, appearing as a clear, undulating white line, unobscured by weeds and twigs, and very obvious a quarter of a mile off in many places where in summer it is hardly distinguishable close at hand. The snow reprints it, as it were, in clear white type, Alto relievo. The ornamented grounds of villas which will one day be built here may still preserve some trace of this. The pond rises and falls, but whether regularly or not, and within what period nobody knows, though as usual many pretend to know. It is commonly higher in winter and lower in the summer, though not corresponding to the general wet and dryness. I can remember when it was a foot or two lower, and also when it was at least five feet higher than when I lived by it. There is a narrow sandbar running into it, with very deep water on one side, on which I helped boil a kettle of chowder, some six rods from the main shore about the year 1824, 
which it has not been possible to do for twenty-five years. And, on the other hand, my friends used to listen with incredulity when I told them that a few years later I was accustomed to fish from a boat in a secluded cove in the woods, fifteen rods from the only shore they knew, which place was long since converted into a meadow. But the pond has risen steadily for two years, and now, in the summer of fifty-two, is just five feet higher than when I lived there, or as high as it was thirty years ago, and fishing goes on again in the meadow. This makes a difference of level, at the outside, of six or seven feet, and yet the water shed by the surrounding hills is insignificant in amount, and this overflow must be referred to causes which affect the deep springs. This same summer the pond has begun to fall again. It is remarkable that this fluctuation, whether periodical or not, appears thus to require many years for its accomplishment. I have observed one rise and a part of two falls, and I expect that a dozen or fifteen years hence the water will again be as low as I have ever known it. Flint's Pond a mile eastward allowing for the disturbance occasioned by its inlets and outlets, and the smaller intermediate ponds also, sympathize with Walden, and recently attained their greatest height at the same time with the latter. The same is true as far as my observation goes, of White Pond. This rise and fall of Walden at long intervals serves this use at least, the water standing at this great height for a year or more, though it makes it difficult to walk round it, kills the shrubs and trees which have sprung up about its edge since the last rise. Pitch pines, birches, alders, aspens, and others, and falling again, leaves an unobstructed shore, for unlike many ponds, and all waters which are subject to a daily tide, its shore is cleanest when the water is lowest. On the side of the pond, next my house, a row of pitch pines fifteen feet high has been killed and tipped over as if by a lever, and thus a stop put to their encroachments, and their size indicates how many years have elapsed since the last rise to this height. By this fluctuation the pond asserts its title to a shore, and thus the shore is shorn, and the trees cannot hold it by right of possession. These are the lips of the lake, on which no beard grows. It licks its chaps from time to time. When the weather is at its height, the alders, willows, and maples send forth a mass of fibrous red roots several feet long from all sides of their stems in the water, and to the height of three or four feet from the ground, in the effort to maintain themselves. And I have known the high blueberry bushes about the shore, which commonly produce no fruit, bear an abundant crop under these circumstances. Some have been puzzled to tell how the shore became so regularly paved. My townsmen have all heard the tradition. The oldest people tell me that they heard it in their youth, that anciently the Indians were holding a powwow upon a hill here, which rose as high into the heavens as the pond now sinks deep into the earth. And they used much profanity, as the story goes, though this vice is one of which the Indians were never guilty, and while they were thus engaged, the hill shook and suddenly sank, and only one old squaw named Walden escaped, and from her the pond was named. It has been conjectured that when the hill shook, these stones rolled down its side and became the present shore. It is very certain, at any rate, that once there was no pond here, and now there is one, and this Indian fable does not in any respect conflict with the account of the ancient settler whom I have mentioned, who remembers so well when he first came here with his divining rod. 
saw a thin vapor rising from the sward, and the hazel pointed steadily downward, and he concluded to dig a well here. As for the stones, many still think that they are hardly to be accounted for by the action of the waves on these hills. But I observe that the surrounding hills are remarkably full of the same kind of stones, so that they have been obliged to pile them up in walls on both sides of the railroad cut nearest the pond, and moreover there are more stones where the shore is most abrupt, so that unfortunately it is no longer a mystery to me. I detect the paver. If the name was not derived from that of some English locality, Saffron Walden, for instance, one might suppose that it was called originally Walled-In Pond. The pond was my well, ready dug. For four months in the year its water is as cold as it is pure at all times, and I think that it is then as good as any if not the best in the town. In the winter all water which is exposed to the air is colder than springs and wells which are protected from it. The temperature of the pond water, which had stood in the room where I sat from five o'clock in the afternoon till noon the next day, the 6th of March, 1846, the thermometer having been up to sixty-five or seventy degrees some of the time, owing partly to the sun on the roof, was forty-two degrees, or one degree colder than the water of one of the coldest wells in the village just drawn. The temperature of the boiling spring the same day was forty-five degrees, or the warmest of any water tried, though it is the coldest that I know of in summer, when beside shallow and stagnant surface water is not mingled with it. Moreover, in summer Walden never becomes so warm as most water which is exposed to the sun, on account of its depth. In the warmest weather I usually placed a pailful in my cellar, where it became cool in the night, and remained so during the day, though I also resorted to a spring in the neighborhood. It was as good when a week old as the day it was dipped, and had no taste of the pump. Whoever camps for a week in summer by the shore of a pond needs only bury a pail of water a few feet deep in the shade of his camp to be independent of the luxury of ice. There have been caught in Walden pickerel, one weighing seven pounds, to say nothing of another which carried off a reel with great velocity, which the fisherman safely set down at eight pounds because he did not see him perch and pouts, some of each weighing over two pounds, shiners, chivins or roach, a very few breams, and a couple of eels, one weighing four pounds. I am thus particular because the weight of a fish is commonly its only title to fame, and these are the only eels I have heard of here. Also, I have a faint recollection of a little fish some five inches long, with silvery sides and a greenish back, somewhat dace-like in its character, which I mention here chiefly to link my facts to fable. Nevertheless this pond is not very fertile in fish. Its pickerel, though not abundant, are its chief boast. I have seen at one time, lying on the ice, pickerel of at least three different kinds, a long and shallow one, steel-colored, most like those caught in the river, a bright golden kind, with greenish reflections and remarkably deep, which is the most common here, and another golden-colored, and shaped like the last, but peppered on the sides with small dark brown or black spots, intermixed with a few faint blood-red ones very much like a trout. The specific name, reticulatus, would not apply to this. It should be guttatus, rather. These are all very firm fish, 
and weigh more than their size promises. The shiners, pouts, and perch also, and indeed all the fishes which inhabit this pond, are much cleaner, handsomer, and firmer fleshed than those in the river, and most other ponds, as the water is purer, and they can easily be distinguished from them. Probably many ichthyologists would make new varieties of some of them. There are also a certain race of frogs and tortoises, and a few mussels in it. Muskrats and mink leave their traces about it, and occasionally a traveling mud turtle visits it. Sometimes, when I pushed off my boat in the morning, I disturbed a great mud turtle which had secreted himself under the boat in the night. Ducks and geese frequent it in the spring and fall. The white-bellied swallows, hirundo bicolor, skim over it, and the peatweets, totinus macularius, teeter along its stony shores all summer. I have sometimes disturbed a fish-hawk sitting on a white pine over the water, but I doubt if it is ever profaned by the wind of a gull, like Fair Haven. At most it tolerates one annual loon. These are all the animals of consequence which frequent it now. You may see from a boat, in calm weather, near the sandy eastern shore, where the water is eight or ten feet deep, and also in some other parts of the pond, some circular heaps half a dozen feet in diameter, by a foot in height, consisting of small stones less than a hen's egg in size, where all around is bare sand. At first you wonder if the Indians could have formed them on the ice for any purpose, and so, when the ice melted, they sank to the bottom. But they are too regular, and some of them plainly too fresh for that. They are similar to those found in rivers, but as there are no suckers nor lampreys here, I know not by what fish they could be made. Perhaps they are the nests of the chivin. These lend a pleasing mystery to the bottom. The shore is irregular enough not to be monotonous. I have in my mind's eye the western, indented with deep bays, the bolder northern, and the beautifully scalloped southern shore, where successive capes overlap each other and suggest unexplored coves between. The forest was never so good a setting, nor is so distinctly beautiful, as when seen from the middle of a small lake, amid hills which rise from the water's edge. For the water in which it is reflected not only makes the best foreground in such a case, but with its winding shore the most natural and agreeable boundary to it. There is no rawness nor imperfection in its edge there, as where the axe has cleared a part, or a cultivated field abuts on it. The trees have ample room to expand on the water-side, and each sends forth its most vigorous branch in that direction. There nature has woven a natural selvage, and the eye rises by just gradations from the low shrubs of the shore to the highest trees. There are few traces of man's hand to be seen. The water laves the shore as it did a thousand years ago. A lake is the landscape's most beautiful and expressive feature. It is earth's eye, looking into which the beholder measures the depth of his own nature. The fluviatile trees next the shore are the slender eyelashes which fringe it, and the wooded hills and cliffs around it are its overhanging brows. Standing on the smooth sandy beach at the east end of the pond, in a calm September afternoon, when a slight haze makes the opposite shoreline indistinct, 
I have seen whence came the expression, the glassy surface of a lake. When you invert your head, it looks like a thread of finest gossamer stretched across the valley, and gleaming against the distant pine woods, separating one stratum of the atmosphere from another. You would think that you could walk dry under it to the opposing hills, and that the swallows which skim over might perch on it. Indeed, they sometimes dive below this line as if it were by mistake and are undeceived. As you look over the pond westward, you are obliged to employ both your hands to defend your eyes against the reflected as well as the true sun, for they are equally bright. And if between the two you survey its surface critically, it is literally as smooth as glass, except where the skater insects at equal intervals scatter over its whole extent by their motions in the sun, produce the finest imaginable sparkle on it. Or, perchance, a duck plumes itself. Or, as I have said, a swallow skims so low as to touch it. It may be that in the distance a fish describes an arc of three or four feet in the air, and there is one bright flash where it emerges and another where it strikes the water. Sometimes the whole silvery arc is revealed, or here and there, perhaps, is a thistle-down floating on its surface, which the fishes dart at, and so dimple it again. It is like molten glass, cooled but not congealed, and the few motes in it are pure and beautiful like the imperfections in glass. You may often detect a yet smoother and darker water, separated from the rest as if by an invisible cobweb, boom of the water nymphs resting on it. From a hilltop you can see a fish leap in almost any part for not a pickerel or shiner picks an insect from this smooth surface, but it manifestly disturbs the equilibrium of the whole lake. It is wonderful with what elaborateness this simple fact is advertised. This piscine murder will out, and from my distant perch I distinguish the circling undulations when they are half a dozen rods in diameter. You can even detect a water-bug, Gyranus, ceaselessly progressing over the smooth surface a quarter of a mile off, for they furrow the water slightly, making a conspicuous ripple bounded by two diverging lines. But the skaters glide over it without rippling it perceptibly. When the surface is considerably agitated, there are no skaters nor water-bugs on it, but apparently, in calm days, they leave their havens and adventurously glide forth from the shore by short impulses till they completely cover it. It is a soothing employment on one of those fine days in the fall, when all the warmth of the sun is fully appreciated to sit on a stump on such a height as this, overlooking the pond, and study the dimpling circles which are incessantly inscribed on its otherwise invisible surface amid the reflected skies and trees. Over this great expanse there is no disturbance, but it is thus at once gently smoothed away and assuaged, as when a vase of water is jarred, the trembling circles seek the shore, and all is smooth again. Not a fish can leap or an insect fall on the pond, but it is thus reported in circling dimples, in lines of beauty, 
as it were the constant welling up of its fountain, the gentle pulsing of its life, the heaving of its breast, the thrills of joy and thrills of pain are indistinguishable. How peaceful the phenomena of the lake! Again the works of man shine as in the spring. Ay, every leaf and twig and stone and cobweb sparkles now at mid-afternoon, as when covered with dew in a spring morning. Every motion of an oar or an insect produces a flash of light, and if an oar falls, how sweet the echo. In such a day, in September or October, Walden is a perfect forest mirror, set round with stones as precious to my eye as if fewer or rarer. Nothing so fair, so pure, and at the same time so large as a lake, perchance, lies on the surface of the earth. Sky water. It needs no fence. Nations come and go without defiling it. It is a mirror which no stone can crack, whose quick silver will never wear off, whose gilding nature continually repairs. No storms, no dust, can dim its surface ever fresh. A mirror in which all impurity presented to it sinks, swept and dusted by the sun's hazy brush. This the light dust cloth, which retains no breath that is breathed on it, but sends its own to float as clouds high above its surface and be reflected in its bosom still. A field of water betrays the spirit that is in the air. It is continually receiving new life and motion from above. It is intermediate in its nature between land and sky. On land only the grass and trees wave but the water itself is rippled by the wind. I see where the breeze dashes across it by the streaks or flakes of light. It is remarkable that we can look down on its surface. We shall perhaps look down thus on the surface of air at length, and mark where a still subtler spirit sweeps over it. The skaters and water-bugs finally disappear in the latter part of October, when the severe frosts have come. And then, and in November, usually in a calm day, there is absolutely nothing to ripple the surface. One November afternoon, in the calm at the end of a rainstorm of several days' duration, when the sky was still completely overcast and the air was full of mist, I observed that the pond was remarkably smooth, so that it was difficult to distinguish its surface, though it no longer reflected the bright tints of October, but the somber November colors of the surrounding hills. Though I passed over it as gently as possible, the slight undulations produced by my boat extended almost as far as I could see, and gave a ribbed appearance to the reflections. But, as I was looking over the surface, I saw here and there at a distance a faint glimmer, as if some skater insects which had escaped the frosts might be collected there or, perchance, the surface, being so smoothed, betrayed where a spring welled up from the bottom. 
paddling gently to one of these places, I was surprised to find myself surrounded by myriads of small perch, about five inches long, of a rich bronze color in the green water, sporting there and constantly rising to the surface and dimpling it, sometimes leaving bubbles on it. In such transparent and seemingly bottomless water, reflecting the clouds, I seem to be floating through the air as in a balloon, and their swimming impressed me as a kind of flight, or hovering, as if they were a compact flock of birds passing just beneath my level on the right or left. Their fins, like sails, set all around them. There were many such schools in the pond, apparently improving the short season before winter would draw an icy shutter over their broad skylight, sometimes giving to the surface an appearance as if a slight breeze struck it, or a few raindrops fell there. When I approached carelessly and alarmed them, they made a sudden splash and rippling with their tails, as if one had struck the water with a bushy bow, and instantly took refuge in the depths. At length the wind rose, the mist increased, and the waves began to run, and the perch leaped much higher than before, half out of water, a hundred black points, three inches long, at once above the surface. Even as late as the 5th of December one year, I saw some dimples on the surface, and thinking it was going to rain hard immediately, the air being full of mist, I made haste to take my place at the oars and row homeward. Already the rain seemed rapidly increasing, though I felt none on my cheek, and I anticipated a thorough soaking. But suddenly the dimples ceased, for they were produced by the perch, which the noise of my oars had seared into the depths, and I saw their schools dimly disappearing. So I spent a dry afternoon, after all. An old man who used to frequent this pond nearly sixty years ago, when it was dark with surrounding forests, tells me that in those days he sometimes saw it all alive with ducks and other waterfowl, and that there were many eagles about it. He came here a-fishing, and used an old log canoe which he found on the shore. It was made of two white pine logs dug out and pinned together, and was cut off square at the ends. It was very clumsy, but lasted a great many years before it became waterlogged and perhaps sank to the bottom. He did not know whose it was. It belonged to the pond. He used to make a cable for his anchor of strips of hickory bark tied together. An old man, a potter, who lived by the pond before the Revolution, told him once that there was an iron chest at the bottom, and that he had seen it. Sometimes it would come floating up to the shore, but when you went toward it, it would go back into the deep water and disappear. I was pleased to hear of the old log canoe, which took the place of an Indian one of the same material but more graceful construction, which perchance had first been a tree on the bank, and then, as it were, fell into the water, to float there for a generation, the most proper vessel for the lake. I remember that when I first looked into these depths, there were many large trunks to be seen indistinctly lying on the bottom, which had either been blown over formerly, or left on the ice at the last cutting, when wood was cheaper, but now they have mostly disappeared. When I first paddled a boat on Walden, it was completely surrounded by thick and lofty pine and oak woods, and in some of its coves grapevines had run over the trees next the water, and formed bowers 
under which a boat could pass. The hills which form its shores are so steep, and the woods on them then so high, that as you looked down from the west end it had the appearance of an amphitheatre for some land of sylvan spectacle. I have spent many an hour, when I was younger, floating over its surface as the zephyr willed, having paddled my boat to the middle, and lying on my back across the seats in a summer forenoon, dreaming awake, until I was aroused by the boat touching the sand, and I arose to see what shore my fates had impelled me to. Days when idleness was the most attractive and productive industry. Many a forenoon have I stolen away, preferring to spend thus the most valued part of the day. For I was rich, if not in money, in sunny hours and summer days, and spent them lavishly. Nor do I regret that I did not waste more of them in the workshop or the teacher's desk. But since I left those shores, the wood choppers have still further laid them waste, and now for many a year there will be no more rambling through the aisles of the wood, with occasional vistas through which you see the water. My muse may be excused if she is silent henceforth. How can you expect the birds to sing when their groves are cut down? Now the trunks of trees on the bottom, and the old log canoe, and the dark surrounding woods are gone, and the villagers, who scarcely know where it lies, instead of going to the pond to bathe or drink, are thinking to bring its water which should be as sacred as the Ganges, at least, to the village in a pipe, to wash their dishes with, to earn their Walden by the turning of a cock or the drawing of a plug. That devilish iron horse, whose ear-rending neigh is heard throughout the town, has muddied the boiling spring with his foot, and he it is that has browsed off all the woods on Walden shore, that Trojan horse, with a thousand men in his belly, introduced by mercenary Greeks. Where is the country's champion, the moor of Moor Hill, to meet him at the deep cut, and thrust an avenging lance between the ribs of the bloated pest? Nevertheless, of all the characters I have known, perhaps Walden wears best, and best preserves its purity. Many men have been likened to it, but few deserve that honor. Though the woodchoppers have laid bare first this shore and then that, and the Irish have built their sties by it, and the railroad has infringed on its border, and the ice-men have skimmed it once. It is itself unchanged. The same water which my youthful eyes fell on, all the change is in me. It has not acquired one permanent wrinkle after all its ripples. It is perennially young, and I may stand and see a swallow dip, apparently to pick an insect from its surface as of yore. It struck me again to-night, as if I had not seen it almost daily for more than twenty years. Why, here is Walden, the same woodland lake that I discovered so many years ago, where a forest was cut down last winter. Another is springing up by its shore as lustily as ever. The same thought is welling up to its surface that was then. It is the same liquid joy 
and happiness to itself and its maker, aye, and it may be to me. It is the work of a brave man, surely, in whom there was no guile. He rounded this water with his hand, deepened and clarified it in his thought, and in his will bequeathed it to concord. I see by its face that it is visited by the same reflection, and I can almost say, Walden, is it you? It is no dream of mine to ornament a line. I cannot come nearer to God and heaven than I live to Walden even. I am its stony shore, and the breeze that passes o'er, and the hollow of my hand are its water and its sand, and its deepest resort lies high in my thought. The cars never pause to look at it, yet I fancy that the engineers and firemen and brakemen and those passengers who have a season ticket and see it often are better men for the sight. The engineer does not forget at night, or his nature does not, that he has held this vision of serenity and purity once at least during the day. Though seen but once, it helps to wash out State Street and the engine's soot. One proposes that it be called God's Drop. I have said that Walden has no visible inlet nor outlet, but it is on the one hand distantly and indirectly related to Flint's Pond, which is more elevated, by a chain of small ponds coming from that quarter, and on the other directly and manifestly to Concord River, which is lower, by a similar chain of ponds, through which in some other geological period it may have flowed, and by a little digging, which, God forbid, it can be made to flow thither again. If by living thus reserved and austere, like a hermit in the woods, so long it has acquired such wonderful purity, who would not regret that the comparatively impure waters of Flint's Pond should be mingled with it, or itself should ever go to waste its sweetness in the ocean's wave. Flint's or Sandy Pond, in Lincoln, our greatest lake and inland sea, lies about a mile east of Walden. It is much larger, being said to contain one hundred and ninety-seven acres, and is more fertile in fish. But it is comparatively shallow and not remarkably pure. A walk through the woods thither was often my recreation. It was worth the while, if only to feel the wind blow on your cheeks freely, and see the waves run, and remember the life of mariners. I went a chestnutting there in the fall on windy days, when the nuts were dropping into the water, and were washed to my feet. And one day as I crept along its sedgy shore, the fresh spray blowing in my face, I came upon the mouldering wreck of a boat, the sides gone, and hardly more than the impression of its flat bottom left amid the rushes, yet its model was sharply defined, as if it were a large decayed pad with its veins. It was as impressive a wreck as one could imagine on the seashore, and had as good a moral. It is by this time mere vegetable mould and undistinguishable pond shore, through which rushes and flags have pushed up. I used to admire the ripple marks on the sandy bottom, at the north end of this pond, made firm and hard to the feet of the wader by the pressure of the water, and the rushes which grew in Indian file, in waving lines, 
corresponding to these marks, rank behind rank, as if the waves had planted them. There also I have found, in considerable quantities, curious balls, composed apparently of fine grass or roots, of pipewort perhaps, from half an inch to four inches in diameter, and perfectly spherical. They wash back and forth in shallow water on a sandy bottom, and are sometimes cast on the shore. They are either solid grass, or have a little sand in the middle. At first you would say that they were formed by the action of the waves, like a pebble. Yet the smallest are made of equally coarse materials, half an inch long, and they are produced only at one season of the year. Moreover, the waves, I suspect, do not so much construct as wear down a material which has already acquired consistency. They preserve their form when dry for an indefinite period. Flint's Pond Such is the poverty of our nomenclature. What right had the unclean and stupid farmer whose farm abutted on this sky-water, whose shores he has ruthlessly laid bare to give his name to it. Some skin-flint, who loved better the reflecting surface of a dollar or a bright scent, in which he could see his own brazen face, who regarded even the wild ducks which settled in it as trespassers. His fingers grown into crooked and bony talons from the long habit of grasping harpy-like. So it is not named for me. I go not there to see him nor to hear of him, who never saw it, who never bathed in it, who never loved it, who never protected it, who never spoke a good word for it, nor thanked God that he had made it. Rather let it be named from the fishes that swim in it, the wild fowl or quadrupeds which frequent it, the wild flowers which grow by its shore, or some wild man or child the thread of whose history is interwoven with its own, not for him who could show no title to it but the deed which a like-minded neighbor or legislature gave him, him who thought only of its money value, whose presence perchance cursed all the shores, who exhausted the land around it, and would fain have exhausted the waters within it, who regretted only that it was not English hay or cranberry meadow. There was nothing to redeem it, forsooth, in his eyes, and would have drained and sold it for the mud at its bottom. It did not turn his mill, and it was no privilege to him to behold it. I respect not his labors. His farm where everything has its price, who would carry the landscape, who would carry his god to market, if he could get anything for him, who goes to market for his god as it is, on whose farm nothing grows free, whose fields bear no crops, whose meadows no flowers, whose trees no fruits but dollars, who loves not the beauty of his fruits, whose fruits are not ripe for him till they are turned to dollars. Give me the poverty that enjoys true wealth. Farmers are respectable and interesting to me in proportion as they are poor, poor farmers. A model farm, where the house stands like a fungus in a muck heap, chambers for men, horses, oxen, and swine, cleansed and uncleansed, all contiguous to one another, stocked with men, a great grease-spot, redolent of manures and buttermilk, 
under a high state of cultivation being manured with the hearts and brains of men, as if you were to raise your potatoes in the churchyard. Such is a model farm. No, no, if the fairest features of the landscape are to be named after men, let them be the noblest and worthiest men alone. Let our lakes receive as true names at least as the Icarian Sea, where, still the shore, a brave attempt resounds. Goose Pond, of small extent, is on my way to Flint's. Fair Haven, an expensive Concord River, said to contain some seventy acres, is a mile southwest, and White Pond, of about forty acres, is a mile and a half beyond Fair Haven. This is my lake country. These, with Concord River, are my water privileges, and night and day, year in, year out, they grind such grist as I carry to them. Since the woodcutters and the railroad, I myself have profaned Walden, perhaps the most attractive, if not the most beautiful, of all our lakes, the gem of the woods, is White Pond. Poor name for its commonness, whether derived from the remarkable purity of its waters or the color of its sands. In these, as in other respects, however, it is a lesser twin of Walden. They are so much alike that you would say they must be connected underground. It has the same stony shore, and its waters are of the same hue. As at Walden, in sultry dog-day weather, looking down through the woods on some of its bays, which are not so deep, but that the reflection from the bottom tinges them, its waters are of a misty bluish-green or glaucous color. Many years since I used to go there to collect the sand by cartloads to make sandpaper with, and I have continued to visit it ever since. One who frequents it proposes to call it Virid Lake. Perhaps it might be called Yellow Pine Lake, from the following circumstance. About fifteen years ago you could see the top of a pitch pine, of the kind called yellow pine hereabouts, though it is not a distinct species, projecting above the surface in deep water many rods from the shore. It was even supposed by some that the pond had sunk, and this was one of the primitive forests that formerly stood there. I find that even so long ago as 1792, in a topographical description of the town of Concord, by one of its citizens, in the collections of the Massachusetts Historical Society, the author, after speaking of Walden and White Ponds, adds, In the middle of the latter may be seen, when the water is very low, a tree, which appears as if it grew in the place where it now stands. Although the roots are fifty feet below the surface of the water, the top of this tree is broken off, and at the place measures fourteen inches in diameter. In the spring of forty-nine I talked with a man who lives nearest the pond in Sudbury, who told me that it was he who got out this tree ten or fifteen years before. As near as he could remember it stood twelve or fifteen rods from the shore, where the water was thirty or forty feet deep. It was in the winter, and he had been getting out ice in the forenoon, and had resolved that in the afternoon, with the aid of his neighbors, he would take out the old yellow pine— he sawed a channel in the ice toward the shore and hauled it over and along and out onto the ice with oxen. But before he had gone far in his work he was surprised to find that it was wrong end upward, with the stumps of the branches pointing down, and the small end firmly fastened in the sandy bottom. It was about a foot in diameter at the big end and he had expected to get a good saw-log, but it was so rotten as to be fit only for fuel, if for that. 
He had some of it in his shed then. There were marks of an axe and of woodpeckers on the butt. He thought that it might have been a dead tree on the shore, but was finally blown over into the pond, and after the top had been waterlogged, while the butt-end was still dry and light, had drifted out and sunk, wrong end up. His father, eighty years old, could not remember when it was not there. Several pretty large logs may still be seen lying on the bottom, where, owing to the undulation of the surface, they look like huge water-snakes in motion. This pond has rarely been profaned by a boat, for there is little in it to tempt a fisherman. Instead of the white lily which requires mud, or the common sweet flag, the blue flag, iris versicolor, grows thinly in the pure water, rising from the stony bottom all around the shore, where it is visited by hummingbirds in June, and the color both of its bluish blades and its flowers, and especially their reflections, is in singular harmony with the glaucous water. White Pond and Walden are great crystals on the surface of the earth, lakes of light. If they were permanently congealed, and small enough to be clutched, they would perchance be carried off by slaves, like precious stones, to adorn the heads of emperors. But, being liquid and ample, and secured to us and our successors for ever, we disregard them, and run after the diamond of Kohanor. They are too pure to have a market value. They contain no muck. How much more beautiful than our lives! How much more transparent than our characters are they! We never learned meanness of them. How much fairer than the pool before the farmer's door, in which his ducks swim! Hither the clean wild ducks come. Nature has no human inhabitant who appreciates her. The birds with their plumage and their notes are in harmony with the flowers. But what youth or maiden conspires with the wild, luxuriant beauty of nature? She flourishes most alone, far from the towns where they reside. Talk of heaven, you disgrace earth. End of chapter 9